Hi, we're Pastors Corey and Melissa Inslee right here at the Exchange Worship Center. And we are so honored that you chose to tune in and watch us live. Man, get out your Bibles, your notebooks, follow along with the message. And we pray that it's a blessing to you this morning. We'll see you right after this message. So thank y'all for coming here today. We appreciate it. Uh, like I said, we're starting a brand new series. We just finished up Life in 3D, and I hope that was a blessing to you. All of that's on the app. It's on the website, YouTube, Facebook. Y'all go check it out if y'all haven't been here. But uh, we are starting a brand new series this morning called To Hell and Back. To Hell and Back. Now, do not take that title and make a whole teaching of it on your own about it, of, you know, how you think, well, the pastor says that we, you know, if you go to hell, you can get out of it. That's not what I'm talking about, okay, because the reason we're calling it this is because we're also going to be talking about um, the hell we go through in life. Come on, how many have been through some hell this past week? Come on, maybe even this morning? Come on, don't look at your wife. Turn away, turn away. She ain't the devil, Amen. And so, you know, there's things we go through in life that we would consider, oh, I've, man, you have ever told anybody that? Man, this week I've been to hell and back. I've been to hell and back. And it's just, it's been something that's trying on you. It's just, you know, uh, just something that's really taxing on your life. And so we're going to be getting into that subject too, not just about an eternal hell, but uh, we're going to broaden the spectrum here of what we're going to be talking about this month. So we will be examining an eternal destination of hell, and we will also be examining the hell we go through in life. But as always, we have a theme scripture we want to uh, talk about. We'll talk about this every single Sunday. Revelations 20, 12 through 15. You'll see it right above me on the screen. You can go ahead and look in your Bibles. You can look on your mobile phones uh, with the uh, Bible app. There is a Bible app on your EWC app. I don't know if you knew that or not. Yeah, we take care of you here at the EWC. And so if you have our app, you know, there's a Bible on there. And so um, either way, if you want to flip through some pages, I still love hearing the, the Bible pages, amen? It's like wings of angels, come on. And so, you know, it's a good thing. So either, any way that you get the gospel, go ahead and turn over to Revelations 20, 12 through 15. If you're watching live via Facebook, it'll be on your lower left-hand, right-hand corner, whichever one you're looking at it. And it says this, Revelations 20, 12 through 15. I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before God's throne, and the books were opened, including... The book of life. And so this implies that there's more than one book, not just the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up its dead and death and the grave gave up their dead. And all were judged according to their deeds. Then death and the grave were thrown into the lake of fire. This lake of fire is the second death. And anyone whose name was not found recorded in the book of life was thrown in to the lake of fire. Now, that's our theme scripture. And a lot of people don't like that scripture because automatically they think, whoa, you just said anybody not found in the book was thrown into the lake of fire. Why would a loving God, come on, how how many agree we serve a loving God? A loving God, amen, the love of God. And how many, and you know, we, we say, how, how could a loving God send someone to hell? I'm here to tell you this morning that God does not send anybody to hell. We send ourselves. And so stop looking all judgmental and stop looking to God shaking your fist. It's us and the responsibility that we have to follow Jesus Christ, amen? Now, through this series, I want you to realize that Hell isn't only a Christian thing. Many religions believe in hell. They just believe it in different aspects. I just want to run through a few here. Uh, The ancient Greeks believed everyone went to Hades, down the river of Styx in the afterlife. Styx is spelled S-T-Y-X. And yes, that's the group that some of you older folks might know about, the group, the, the rock band Styx. They derived that name from the Greeks and this belief of going down a river uh, to Hades in the afterlife. In Judaism, hell is a place of punishment for unbelievers, but only stay there for no more than a year as punishment. Buddhism and Hinduism both believe basically in the same thing, believing multiple levels of hell exist 
up to 31 different levels going from hot to cold. Come on, sounds like Texas, amen? The lower planes are where beings roam aimlessly, lost in confusion and suffering, and 16 planes of those are scorching heat while being pierced by spears, eventually due to karma being reborn as an animal or another human in another time. This is what the Buddhists and the Hindus believe. Islam teaches that hell is an evil resting place where the people are showered with water as hot as molten brass, which scolds their faces while wearing garments of fire and are lashed with rods of iron. There's some different beliefs in hell. Christianity, of course, says we teach that hell is a place, but it was prepared for the devil and his angels, but also later for those that choose to follow him over, making Jesus their savior, uh, will follow the enemy there. But over time, we have redesigned the reason and the rules to justify our ways of life and redesigned hell in our own imaginations. I want to bring you a message this morning, part one in this series called Redesigning Hell, Redesigning Hell, because we do that. I mean, you look all over the media, uh, they have taken hell and made it a a party place, right? We'll go and we'll we'll go drink some beers in hell, you know, songs in in the the rock world will will talk about hell of being a party place and a a place of, uh, uh, you know, sexual uh, journeys things that they will experience there. And and we have cartoons that even have indoctrinated the thought for children saying that it's not that bad. It's a funny place. It's somebody with a a red suit and a pitchfork that is, you know, uh, doing whatever he does to people. And so we've taken hell and we've, we've redesigned it in our own imagination. Why? Because it gives us the opportunity to justify our lifestyle, to do whatever we want, because hell isn't really that bad. We've done this and we've watered it down from generation to generation, the issue of an eternal hell. Asking the question, how bad is it? And how much pain do I really have to go through? And how long does it last? Because if it isn't that bad and it's not that painful, it's only for a short time, I guess I'll keep living my life like I want to and then just pass through and get through it. But can I tell you, the Bible doesn't talk about passing through it and getting over with it. The Bible refers to hell as a place of eternity, a place of pain, a place of punishment, a place that uh, some people even take the scriptures and they misrepresent it and say that um, you will go there and you're, you're, you will die after a while, so you won't have to suffer. But Jesus was very clear in the sense of saying it is a place of eternity. If you look at the word eternity when he talks about an eternity in heaven compared to an eternity in hell, eternity means eternity. It doesn't mean there's a break, and it doesn't mean a bell rings, and it doesn't mean that you can get out for good behavior, or you get a card that says, get out of hell free. It's a place of eternal damnation. I wrote this down. We tend to redesign hell to reflect our desensitized society, much like we redesign Jesus to fit with our personal agenda. Amen. We redesign things. In our minds, we, we redesign Jesus to fit our cultures. Well, he's a black Jesus. Well, he's a white Jesus. Well, he's a Hispanic Jesus. Jesus was a Jew, people. <laughs> Come on. You know, he, he's, he's, not a, he's not a Caucasian person with blonde flowing hair that, that says, Come to me. But it was the anointing within him. It was the Spirit of God that drew people. It was his words of the Word of God that drew people by the Spirit of God. But we redesigned Jesus to fit our culture, to fit our lifestyle, to fit our time, whether we have time to go to church or we don't have time to go to church. Well, Jesus will understand. Amen? The more we try to downplay Satan's agenda, it only increases the appetite of hell itself. Isaiah 5, 14 says this, Therefore hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth wide without measure, and their glory and their multitude and their pomp, and he that rejoiceth shall descend into it. 
And so here we have a place, it's enlarging itself. Uh, we don't know if that actually means that it is breaking down walls and opening bigger or if it's just meaning that more and more people are going there by their choices because they decide not to follow God. The enemy loves to use religious teachings to blind the minds of the believers and those uh, looking for truth so that they can't see the actual dangers of an eternal hell. Some religions teach that you can pray and pay loved ones out of hell. But Luke 16, 26 says there's a great chasm or a great gulf between that no one can cross. Once you're there, you're there. Once you're in heaven, you're in heaven. Not that you would ever want to leave. But we see through the Bible, we see a story that Jesus told of the, the, the rich man and a, a man named Lazarus, not the Lazarus that we know that he rose from the dead. It was just a common name, so he used it within the parable. And so we have the rich man and we have Lazarus, which, which was a beggar. And the rich man finds himself in hell. The, the uh, Lazarus finds himself in paradise. And he, he begs, he says, please let him come and just drop a drop of water. On my tongue. For I am in immense torment. I, I can't take this. And he's implying that just the drop of water would bring some type of relief to his life. And when he was told that there's a great chasm between him and this was impossible, he said, at least send somebody. And you can, you can imagine the intensity within his voice and as he's being tormented in the very depths of hell. Send somebody to tell my family. Send somebody to tell my friends not to come here. He said, even if Jesus himself came, they wouldn't believe him. We have a world today that is dying and going to hell. And they don't even believe it. They don't even fathom the direction that they're heading. You've ever played that game where you, you say hot or cold because you're getting close to something? Oh, you're cold, you're cold, so you go on the other. Oh, you're hot, you're hot. You know, the people don't even understand as it gets hotter and hotter and their life is coming to an end, the destruction that they're heading towards. Send somebody to tell them. Some teach that even... Everyone will be saved in the end, so there's no need to worry. They take the scripture that says every knee will bow and every tongue will confess, and they take that and twist it and say in the end, a merciful and loving God will save everybody. He'll change his mind and save everyone. But Philippians 3.18 says, I say it again. Oh, I love this. I say it again with tears in my eyes that there are many who conduct uh, who, whose conduct, I'm sorry, whose conduct shows that they are really enemies of the cross of Christ. There are people out there that don't care about God. There's people out there that don't care that Jesus died on the cross. There's people out there that just don't care. And we expect to even think that in the end that God, a loving God, yes, would turn and say, ah, come on. There's so many uh, uh, stories throughout the Bible that are true and real, but God, I believe, placed them there so we can uh, have the understanding that it's time to follow God. Noah and the ark, where people are banging on the door. Let me in, Noah. I tried to tell you. All you did was mock me, and all you did was make fun of me, and now I'm dying out here. I can't open the door. Only God. And he's done shut it. I'm sorry, this is the end for you. And the world died because they refused to believe in an almighty God. And that's the direction that this world is going today. Some teach predestination. That God chooses in advance who goes to heaven and who goes to hell. That sucks. That's like a, a, an intense lottery. Well, okay, I'm sorry. Right down the middle here. Toro, I'm going to let you go to heaven. So everybody over from here from Toro, you know, because i got to see her once in a while, so I don't want to be ticked at me. And so everybody over here, you're going to heaven. Mm -hmm. So we expect to live our lives. And, do, and, and, you know, 
That's not the sense. Acts 2, 21. Can I give you good news? Come on, people over here. Can I give you good news? Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone who believes in the Lord. But the enemy tries to take these scriptures and teachings and, and twist them and contort them and, and make us believe in different things. So what did Jesus teach? Come on, that's what matters, right? What did Jesus teach on the subject of hell? Before we look at that, I want you to hear from Jeremiah, the prophet, because if we can learn from Jeremiah, we can fully understand what Jesus was talking about. Because you have to remember, well, a lot of times you've got to read the Old Testament in the culture of the Old Testament. You've got to read you know, in, of that time. New Testament, same thing. You've got to read it in the culture of the time to understand it. So let's look at this, uh, of what Jeremiah, the prophet, who preached for over 40 years and nobody listened to him. Nobody did anything he said, but my God, he was faithful for 40 years. Amen? Jeremiah 7, 30 through 32 says this, The people of Judah have sinned before my eyes. This is God speaking through Jeremiah to the people, says the Lord. They have set up their abominable idols right in the temple that bears my name, defiling it. They have built pagan shrines at Topeth, the garbage dump in the valley of ben Hammon. And there they burn their sons and their daughters in the fire. I read that right, just so you, I didn't, that wasn't a a mistype, that wasn't a typo. They burn their sons and their daughters in the fire. I have never commanded such a horrible deed. It, it, It never even crossed my mind to command such a thing. So beware, for the time is coming, says the Lord, when the garbage dump will no longer be called Topath or the Valley of ben Hinnom. But the valley of slaughter, they will bury the bodies in Topath until there is no more room for them. So what was the valley of slaughter? It was also known as the valley of Hinnom. It was a valley south of Jerusalem where the Israelites would be, they would do what they call pass the children through the fire. In fact, if you've ever read uh, through the Bible and you, you see uh, them talking about condemning them, You know, do not pass your children through the fire. If you're kind of confused about what that means, uh, this was basically them sacrificing their children to the Canaanite god Molech. I have a picture up here for you. This was Molech. This was uh, what they would do. This uh, idol would have his hands out, and the people back then were a lot smarter than we give them credit for. They would actually have this idol to the place where it had mechanics within it, and they would have the children in their hands, and that it would bring them up, and throw them into a fire. Melech usually had some type of hole within his belly that would have a roaring fire within it. And the people would sacrifice their children to Molech, to where they would burn to death. The children would burn to death within the fire of the belly of the idol. This place that Jeremiah was talking about, it was a place that would be used to burn trash, sewage, corpse of criminals and dead animals. We know a lot of people were were crucified. This was the Romans' way of bringing death and other forms. But uh, when a criminal was either put on the cross or put to death in a different way, this is usually where they would end up. Their bodies would be thrown into this valley and be burned. Dead animals were burned there. It was filled with maggots and worms, and the air was filled with a strong stench of a sickening smoke. 500 years later, Jesus uses the same uh, idea of the location, also known as Guiana, or hell, to instruct the people. He says this, it's his teaching on the mountain. It says, part of it says Mark 9, 47 through 48. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye rather than having two eyes and to be cast into Guiana, or hellfire, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Jesus is talking about an eternal place. Jesus is talking and and referring to a place that is very well known. Oh my gosh, he's the master teacher here. He's the master already, 4D. Come on, 4D. You're not only seeing it, experiencing it, feeling it, but you're smelling it. And he's saying, do you want to go to a place like this? 
He says, it's better that you take action. Now, of course, this ain't actually talking, don't go home, kids, come on, pluck your eye out or anything like that. It's talking about taking action. Do something lest you do nothing. It's better that you get rid of something in your life and go on with God than hold strong and hold tight to what will will, uh, destroy you and go to a place that is never ending. To quench that uh, fire that's never quenched. It's constantly going. So you might be asking yourself, am I going to hell? Come on, that's a big question. People's minds, especially at funerals. You go to funerals and that's where, that's where your mind is going. Is my eternity, my life, my salvation, blah, blah, blah. Am I going to hell? My question to you, if you're going to ask that, am I going to hell? I ask you, is Jesus Lord of your life? Plain and simple. Is Jesus Lord of your life? I did not ask you, are you perfect? Come on, those watching by Facebook, I didn't ask you if you don't have any sin. I said, is Jesus Lord of your life? Was there a time where you knelt at an altar, knelt at your bed, knelt at your your, uh, kitchen table, or just stood upright? I don't care the position of your body. I care about the position of your heart. Did you say, Jesus, I need you in my life. I know I'm a sinner. I know I messed up. I know that there's nothing else that can save me but you. Is Jesus Lord of your life? Now, let's go a step further. I'm not talking about just praying a prayer, but I'm talking about fully involving God into your life. Once again, I didn't ask you if you spoke in tongues. I didn't ask you if you were going to be a preacher. I didn't ask you if you know how many books in the Bible. I didn't ask you if you can quote five scriptures or less. I didn't ask you you if you tithe. I didn't ask you if you do. I didn't ask you all those things. I asked you, are you looking to God in your life? Because the more we look to him, the more we want to be with him. And the more we want to be with him is the more we want to be like him. And then before you know it, the things in your life that do not add up to God, you begin to, I don't need this. I don't want it. I can't have it. And we start cleaning things up in our lives. I'm not saying you'll ever be perfect. And I'm not saying you're, all, you're ever going to be, uh, you know, walk on water and glow in the dark. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about you have a relationship with Christ and you want to do whatever it takes to not disappoint him. I want a relationship with him. In fact, Paul said this in Romans 8, 1 through 2. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong. Come on. Belong. Belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong, there's that word again, for those that belong and because you belong to him, the power of life giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin, sin that leads you to death. To where once it had a hold on you. To once it was pulling you and dragging you in the direction of an eternal hell. But you said, God, please do something in my life. And all of a sudden the chains were broken. And you were heading in a different direction. Not to say that things aren't still pulling at you. And not to say things aren't still tempting you. Jesus himself was tempted in the wilderness. But let me tell you, there's something about to have freedom in your life. That when things are pulling at you, you say, I don't need you. Uh, you know, and you might step in that direction and you might tiptoe in that area, but something within you, the conviction of God says, get away. It's when you aren't fearful and it's when you aren't convicted and it's when you aren't uh, trying to go in a different direction. That's when I get concerned. That's where God gets concerned. That it's so easy and there's no conviction and I don't care what anybody else says and I don't care if there's a heaven or a hell. Guess what? You will sooner or later. I'm free because of the blood of Jesus. It's that blood that covers me. So this morning, I just want to present a few things to you. Instead of wasting our time trying to redesign something that will never change. It might in your mind, well, hell ain't that bad. Or you start believing other religions because that's what we do to to make ourselves feel better. Well, I'll believe this of Christianity. And ooh, 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 I like this in the Hindu because this says I'm coming back as something else. 
What if you come back as a fly? Wouldn't that suck? An ant? You know, something like that. And so we start, we start pulling from different religions to satisfy ourselves. Instead of trying to redesign it, instead of trying to justify yourself, let's, uh, let's redesign what really affects our eternity. How about we start redesigning our relationship with Jesus Christ? Start loving Him more. Take inventory of your relationship with Christ. Are you seeking Him? The Bible says to seek after Him. We need to redesign our relationship. Maybe your relationship isn't what it should be. Maybe you just prayed a prayer once when you were eight and you're still relying on that one time. But you never follow Jesus. You're thinking there's some magical pixie dust in something you just said, but you decided never to really follow him. See, it's more than just saying. Even the Bible says that. It says, do. Don't just hear, do. Put action to it. Be a servant. In fact, Jesus says uh, it says it in the word that when we do get to heaven, and can I just say this? Everybody will get to heaven, but not everybody will get into heaven. Because there comes a day where we stand before God and everybody will lock eyes with God. I don't care if you're going to hell or not, you'll lock eyes with him because he's going to say either, well done, thy good and faithful servant, which is action, which is doing for Him, living for Him, for Him, relying on Him, yes. a relationship with Him, can't do a thing without Him, can't survive without Him, can't breathe without Him, can't think without Him, can't do anything without Him. Uh, good, good, good job, servant. Oh, depart from me. I never knew you. Because you never came in my direction. I don't know about you, but please call me your servant. Please tell me well done. Even when I don't think I did it well myself, please tell me well done. Thy good and faithful servant. Let's redesign our relationship instead of trying to redesign hell. Let's start running. Let's stop running from him. And let's start running to him. Daniel 12, 2 says this. Many of those whose bodies lie dead and buried will rise up, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting disgrace. Some. Let's stop re redesigning hell and start redesigning our lifestyle. Ooh, come on, that's a tough one. Don't mess with my flesh. Don't mess with my flesh. Come on, y'all seen that commercial? Don't mess with my discount. Come on, that, that, don't mess with my flesh. I do what I like to do and don't tell me otherwise. But let me tell you something. It's the flesh that pulls us away. It's the flesh that pulls us in the opposite direction. Now, Pastor Corey, well, I said the prayer when I was eight. I'm good to go. I can live how I want. No, you can't. This is why Jesus told the story of the prodigal son. As long as he's in his presence, as long as he's in the Father's house, as long as he's with the Father, things are good. But if you go off and you just live your life and say, I don't need you, do you really expect to benefit from the things of God? Now, there's those, those that have that gone off and said, God, forgive me. Oh, welcome back. Come on, back into the story. Put the shoes on his feet. Put the ring on his finger. Put the coat on his back. Welcome back into the family of God. There is grace. There is restitution. There is. Because I love that story. We taught on that a few weeks ago about, you know, how the father put his coat on the son, put his ring on his finger, and put his shoes on his feet. There's something about being like the father. Let's redesign our lifestyle. Start obeying him more. Because these things can pull you in the direction that you don't need to be, to get you off track, to get you out of his presence and get you away from God himself. Can I tell you what hell really is? Separation from God. Yeah, the Bible talks about hell, fire, torment, 
punishment, all these different things. But the worst thing I can think about is being totally separated from God himself with no hope of Jesus Christ. Because there is one thing Jesus can't do. And he can't save you from hell once it's over. I wrote this down. Jesus will walk through hell with you here on earth, but you're on your own when it comes to an eternity of hell. Is this, is this helping anybody? Is this making sense? To anybody? Last one, last one. Not only, let's, we can't redesign hell, but let's start redesigning our relationship, redesigning our lifestyle, and last of all, how many know it's not all about you? But let's re redesign our passion. Let's start promoting him more. Let's start promoting Jesus more. There's a world out there that's dying that doesn't have the information and the knowledge that you do because they resist to read it. They resist to listen to it. And they're dying and going to hell, and some of them don't even know it. I read this Wednesday as we got into kind of a discussion, but I wanted to read it again because it's so impacting by Charles Spurgeon. It says this, talking about redesigning our passion, to have a passion for people, have a passion for those that you come in contact with on a daily basis, for those that have a passion for those that maybe you run into. Come on, how many know that God puts uh, divine appointments in your life every day and we need to take advantage of those appointments? He puts somebody in your life for a reason and on purpose. It's not by accident. There's no such thing as a coincidence. So if we have a passion to just plant a seed, oh my gosh, if we could just plant a seed, maybe just telling somebody as the uh, conversation strikes up, can I tell you how God blessed me today? I don't know what you have to do, and I don't know what opportunity you have, but let's have a passion to plant a seed in somebody. Charles Spurgeon said this, If sinners be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our dead bodies. And if they perish, let them perish with our arms wrapped around their knees. If hell must be filled, let it be filled in the teeth of our actions. And let no one go unwarned or unprayed for. In other words, let's do something about it. Let's do something about it. Let's share the gospel, however that is that you share it. Whether, you know the best way to share the gospel is share your testimony. And let them know, it might not happen like this for you, but God will do it because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He will get the job done if you trust him. If they're going to go to hell, let it be over our dead bodies. At least I tried. At least I said something. At least I didn't sit there with my mouth shut saying, I wonder what they're going to think about me. I wonder if they think I'm going to be crazy. Oh, I wonder this and I, who cares? They're dying and going to hell. Aren't you glad somebody spoke up for you? Aren't you glad somebody looked you in the eye and said, there's a God that loves you and a devil that hates you, but there's a, there's a Christ that died on the cross for you and sets you free. You don't have to sin, be in eternity in hell. You can experience heaven. And you can experience heaven on earth. Aren't you glad somebody took the time to talk to you? Hey, everyone. Thank you for watching. Man, we pray that this message was a blessing to you. We pray that it did something inside of you, encouraged you, and inspired you for greatness in the things of God. If you're ever in the Corpus Christi area, come check us out at the EWC. We're located at 6801 Weber Road. And if you feel like God is calling you to be a blessing to this ministry, go on our website, theexchangewc.org. There'll be some instructions on there to help you out. Otherwise, we love that you joined us. We'll see you next time right here at the EWC.